Yeah, hello. Um, so first of all, I wanted to uh, remind people that Thursday's lecture will be on Zoom and it will be at a weird time. Okay, I think 3.20 to uh, 4.55. Whatever it says in the syllabus, but I think that's what it is. Um, okay. And unless there are questions about anything, then just start talking about you. Okay. So, and and uh, before I start talking about it, this, I want to um, remind you that that this. And so, by the way, this is the edition that I used to use. Um, I think it's better. Edition, but it's a lot more expensive. So that's why I switched to the other one. But I'm still using this one because it has my markers in it. But I'll, I'll, I have the pages in the one that I ordered, um, which is the Penguin one. Um, right. And so this book, The Treatise of Human Nature, was Hume's early book, the one that he said that his future critics should ignore because it was, you know, a product of his youth and whatever. Um, so uh, it's quite possible that some of the things that Hume says here are things that he changed his mind about later. I mean, in fact, uh, I think on the issue of geometry in particular, there's some things in the inquiry that make me think that he really changed his mind about what he says here. But still, what he says here is really interesting. So. Um, it's worth talking about, even if he changes his mind about it later. Okay, so, and and that's basically what we're talking about today, right? Geometry, space, I mean, also time, but I'm not going to have time to talk about times. <laughs> it's going to be mostly about space. So, um, and there's two parts to his, I mean, time is supposed to be just like space, right? Um, a lot of people say that. Locke says that. Um, Kant sort of says that. Um, but then time always turns out to involve us all weird issues. But in any case, uh, I'm not going to talk about that. So, um, so there's two parts to human system about space. Um, I mean, I guess the truth is, this is both of these parts are both to apply to both. So I may as well keep time up here for a minute. So the one is that composition of extension out of a finite number of indivisible points. And number two is, or individual, sorry, individual parts. Number two is, Each part is of some definite quality. And I guess so, and he says the qualities must be color or solidity. Um, for visible extension, they have to be of color, and for tangible extension, they have to have solidity. I guess that part applies to space and not to time. Right? So time also is composed of indivisible parts. And each that is temporal extension is composed of indivisible parts. And each one of those parts has to have some quality. Um, but I think as far as time goes, it could be any quality, right? So it could be like a or something. But for space, it has to be color and solidity. Um, um, no other impressions or ideas, Hume says, have the right kind of um, 
disposition towards each other to allow them to, to form spatial extension. Um, I think that spoke to just be self-evident, although how it's self-evident, like what the basis of that knowledge is, is not clear to me. Um, but anyway, right, so he says, like, odors can't be arranged in a circle. Um, passions can't be put next to each other. So that has to be color or solidity. Okay, now, um, but like I said, uh, so that part is only about space and it's mostly space I'm going to be talking about. So um, to understand, so I mean, I guess Barclay agrees with both of these things. Um, however, to understand what Hume says about it, you have to realize right away that this whole section, which is uh, part two of book one of the treatise. Um, this, this whole section is written from the point of view that external objects exist and are represented by our ideas. So that part obviously Barclay doesn't agree with. So um, that is like consistently with what Hume always says about this. Um, he's not maintaining skepticism about the existence of external objects in this context. Um, um, even though the treatise contains a very strong argument for skepticism about the existence of external objects, not just remote objects, but all external objects, um, nevertheless, when he's not engaged in that exact argument, he goes back to the assumption that there are external objects and they're represented by our ideas. But then he takes very literally the view that our ideas represent by resembling their objects. So in particular, for our purposes, there's two things that's relevant here. One is that our ideas can represent visible or tangible objects as being of some size and shape because our ideas themselves are of some size and shape. Right, so we are, we're admitting that there's a distinction between ideas, well, that is between mental representations, whether they're impressions or ideas. We're um, admitting that, that these things represent something external to you. And they represent the thing that's ex that is represents something external to the mind. And they represent the ex thing external to the mind as having a certain shape and size. But they represent it as having a certain shape and size because they themselves have some shape and size. The same shape, shape and size? No, not necessarily, but there's a resemblance. Um, and similarly, uh, um, our ideas represent uh, external objects as color and solid because our ideas themselves are colored and solid. So like, if this thing is red, it's made out of pieces that have the same quality as, as my red idea. Now, he doesn't really argue, I mean, he argues elsewhere in the treatise. Um, for like against the view that our ideas or impressions can represent something fundamentally unlike them. Um, see here, he's just taking for granted that we've um, we've ruled that out. Um, so they they're not identical to them, 
um, that is, they're not literally identical the normal way Barclay would say, nor do they necessarily have exactly the same properties, but they have the same kinds of properties. And every every property that an uh, external object could have, an idea could also have, and vice versa. Um, okay, so that's one thing you have to, to understand to follow this. And the other thing you have to understand, which apparently, well, it's not clear whether Barclay agrees with this or not. But um, but this is what Hume thinks. The only strict sense of larger than is containing a greater number of parts. So if one thing is bigger than another, then strictly speaking, you know, if A is larger than M, that must mean that you can count up the number of parts in A and count up the number of parts in B, and the number of parts in A is greater than the number of parts in B. And like this, this seems to follow from um, Locke's explanation of how we form ideas of quantum. I remember Locke, you know, compared forming ideas, simple modes of extension with forming simple modes of number. So forming simple modes of number involves taking the unit over and over somehow. And forming simple modes of extension also apparently includes taking the same part over and over again. And how many times you take it is how big the extension is. Now, I mean, since Locke doesn't agree with this part, I think I even said this when I talked about Locke, that um, uh, Hume thinks that Locke is inconsistent because Locke must mean this, but you can't mean this unless you agree with this. So Locke is inconsistent. And I use the same facts the other way around to say, Locke doesn't agree with this, therefore he must not mean this. <laughs> uh, right? That he must not think that modes of extension are built up out of the smallest part of extension because he doesn't believe in the smallest part of extension. So the, you know, the nature of the modification must be different. There. But, um, but Hume does think this. Um, and... Um, Can I justify why he thinks that? Because he thinks that that um, quantity is always number, and number is always a number of things. <laughs> um, so. Uh, um, so when I say that A is bigger than B, I must mean there's a greater number of things in A than in B. Um, so like the main application of this to begin with though is not to rule out some other way of comparing the sizes but to say, okay, suppose something is not divisible at all, then nothing could be smaller than that. Right? Because it only has one part or it doesn't have parts, depending on how you look at it. But anyway, it's not divisible at all. Nothing can have fewer parts than it. So nothing could be smaller. So whatever is absolutely simple, First of all, all absolutely simple things are the same size. <laughs> and that size is the smallest size. And so the conclusion from that, the immediate conclusion from that is that 
although there can be things that are too small to see, there can't be things that are too small to imagine. Um, because Hume says um, there's there are indivisible ideas. Now, I mean, he proves that there must be indivisible ideas. Again, using the same standard, right? Because he says, well, it's agreed that we can't have infinitely large ideas, infinitely complex ideas. Everyone agrees with that. But uh, something that's infinitely divisible would have infinitely many parts and therefore would be infinitely large. Since we don't have infinitely large ideas, uh, our ideas must consist of a finite number of parts. And um, of course, a finite number of indivisible parts, right? Because if the parts are divisible, then there's more parts. <laughs> um, so, um, so we must have indivisible ideas. I mean, he also seems to claim that you can kind of see this like inside your mind. You can imagine something, the smallest thing that you can imagine. It can't get any smaller without disappearing. That's a little bit hard to tell if you can do that or not. And Spoon admits, so it's a little weird to get. Um, like when Hume, I think Hume, I'm not sure if he uses the exact verbiage, but says that like there's like degrees of like clarity of like uh, ideas and so uh, impressions to us that it's not what I believe. Does that also apply to like the size of objects? Could you like imagine something as small as it is in real life? Like uh, when you're drawing on a computer, that makes sense. Well, okay, I, I think I know what you're asking, but I want to put that off. I mean, just momentarily, because the because right now we're not talking about how big the object is. We're talking about how big the idea is, right? And you might think, like, we can't compare the size of ideas to the size of objects, right? They're like these are mental entities. They're not, but um, but you can because they have a number of parts. And so um, we know this idea is not only as small as an idea could be, but it's as small as anything. Could be. So if there's some very, very tiny microscopic particles out there, um, they can't be any smaller than this idea. Um, from which it follows that if there are things too small to see and too small to see or too small to feel so like throughout this Hume tried to maintain vision and touch in parallel right he keeps he, he, he keeps talking about both types of extension together Although there seem to be some asymmetries between them or some difference between them. Um, like, well, maybe you, I'm going to talk about a vacuum next, and maybe I'll look from here or there what the differences seem to be. But um, so, anyway, um, if there are things too small to see or too small to feel, um, and Hume says there evidently are. So, I mean, again, this is not being skeptical, skeptical about the existence of external objects, right? Like admitting that our ideas represent external objects. And, you know, we know lots of things about external objects. Like if you take a microscope and you use it to, you know, whatever, spread the rays that come from the thing or however it works. Um, and, uh, um, uh, you can you can tell using the microscope that there are things there that are too small for you to ordinarily see. So if there are things that are too small to see, what that means is that the things we're looking at are much bigger than they see. Right? Like so if a grain of sand looks so small, 
that I can only distinguish 20 parts in it. But I know, so meaning that my idea of it only has 20 parts. My idea or impression of it only has 20 parts. But if I know using a microscope or whatever, the grain of sand actually has 100 million parts, a lot more than that, but anyway, I know that the grain of sand only has, actually has 100 million parts, then that means that the grain of sand is much, much bigger than my idea of the grain of sand. Because my idea only has 20 parts, but the grain of sand itself has 100 million parts, so it's vastly bigger than it looks. <laughs> So, um, and in fact, and I'm not sure if this is what you're asking, but Hume says that um, the true sense in which the, the grain of sand is not too small for us to imagine, it's too big for us to imagine. <laughs> that is, it's too big for us to accurately or adequately imagine because we can't hold all 10 million or 100 million parts in our mind at the same time. So we can only imagine the grain of sand in a somewhat or vastly confused impression. It resembles us, but only in a very broad outline, right? <laughs> um, the grain of sand has lots of detail that isn't represented by our idea. Um, now, um, so this also means that um, every object is really larger or smaller than or exactly equal to every other object in this strict sense, right? Everything out in the world has some definite number of indivisible parts. I mean, you could worry about like if we really decided which parts belong to an object or not, or you know, but never mind. So every object out in the world has some definite number of indivisible parts. Um so if you compare two objects, um, if you could count all the parts, you would know for sure that one is bigger and the other is smaller or that they're exactly equal. Um, however, in general, we can't see the indivisible parts. Um, so, uh, um, well, and I, I think there's there's two ways to look at this. And the the first way um, is that well, and so therefore, even though it's always true that one is bigger or that they're exactly equal, we can't always tell which. Do you have a question? I have a question about us having ideas of things. Yeah. And how our ideas are made out of finite parts, and if our ideas are made up of less parts, are they the same type of parts, but just less of them than the real thing, or are they a different type of part? Well, I'm not sure what you mean by type of part. You mean, like, do they have the same quality? Like, like when he's saying that objects are made out of these finite parts. Yeah. Are we, when we imagine the idea of that object, are we imagining the same parts? But just less of them make up the same object, the idea of the object. Um, so they're not the same, right? Because, you know, like maybe I should make the, the grain of sand not quite so big, but I can draw them, you know. So, you know, there's 20 parts in here, and there's, you know, however many million. Uh, other parts out here. And there's, there's nothing that's a part of this and of this, like they don't overlap each other or whatever, at, at least not normally. I mean, maybe if ideas are really material and you're looking at your own brain, or but not normally, right? They don't overlap each other. So, uh, so they're not literally the same parts. 
Um, but, and obviously they're not in one, one to one correspondence because there's a lot more of these. I think, I think that's why I thought if you're asking like, like if if these are if these parts are all brown, does that mean all these parts are brown, or some of them are brown? I you know I mean that's a good question. Like you would think since this is supposed to be some kind of resemblance, um, right? Because as you probably know, in fact, if you look at a grain. Of sand, you don't have to magnify it that much, and the color completely changes. It looks transparent, whatever. Locke mentions that. Um, so, yeah, I don't know exactly what Hume thinks that relationship has to be. Uh, good question, actually. I mean, he's going to talk later about the fact that everything has to be some determinate color. And then, wait, is this in Locke? No, I think it's in here. Well, maybe they both talk about this. Yeah, I think they both talk about it. They use different examples. Locke talks about, you know, some kind of fluid that looks different colors when you look at it for different angles. And he says, well, um, it's not really that it's two different colors at the same time. It's when you when you turn it, you're seeing different parts of it, <laughs> right? And Hume says something similar about the colors you see in clouds or whatever, from different points of view. But I don't, you know, that's not going to explain this problem. Um, not really, really any of the colors that you see. Um, yeah, I'm not sure. <laughs> it's a good question. All right. Um, I think in general, he, you know, yeah, I think in general, he thinks of these parts as being having the same quality as those parts or resembling the quality. But I think if you thought about it more, you would realize you would, you would know better. And then I'm not sure what exactly what you'd say. Um, in general, you can't tell which is what I was like. So I was saying, so the problem, the first way of looking at the problem might be to say, well, since we can't see all the individual parts, we can't always tell which one is bigger. But I think like Hume is going to take it further and say that um, um, since we can't see the individual parts, even when we quote unquote can tell which one is bigger, we're not doing it by counting the parts. So the strict standard, if I ask, you know, which of these two big grains of sand is bigger? Or, I mean, maybe I should use something like really clear, actually, you know, like, uh, is this table bigger than this piece of chalk, right? So, I mean, in that case, for sure, it's not a borderline case. But Hume says, how did you know? Not by counting the individual parts of the piece of chalk and comparing them, counting the individual parts of the table and seeing which one is a larger number, right? You can't do that at all. And in fact, Hume says that even in the case of our own ideas, where in principle we could count the indivisible parts, um, in practice that's too hard, right? Like the imagination is weak when it deals with such tiny things, and it can't like keep track of them long enough to count them. What we need to do. So he says that um, we seldom or never use this strict standard. So the strict standard is like the definition of greater or less, but we never use it when we actually say that one thing is bigger than another. Um, so when we actually compare the size of things, we use something else, which he calls the looser standard. But to begin with, it's not, it's not a looser version of the same thing. It's something completely different. Um, he says, that um, 
It's derived from, quote, the whole united appearance. This is in uh, um, section four. So that is book one, part two, section four. And it's on page 95 in your edition. Where we talked about the looser standard. He said it's derived from the whole united appearance, which means like we just look at it and see. Right? I just, just put the chalk next to the table and just look at it. You can see which one is bigger, and you don't have to count anything. Um, so uh, that standard. Um, doesn't always give a verdict. Sometimes you put two things next to each other and you can't tell just by looking at it which one is better. Sometimes it leads us astray. What does it mean to say it leads us astray? It gives us inconsistent results or something like that. And in those cases, we have ways of, of correcting it. Um, that is, We've learned empirically that you can get more consistent results by doing certain things, like taking a ruler that's measured off into parts and comparing it to you. Yeah. Would that be like um, that test where you put the one really long cylindrical tube and the, the short tube and you put the same volume of water in them? You know, ask the person to, to tell which is greater in general, and you know, someone that's not so versed would say that the, the taller one is greater, even though they're the same mass. The same volume of water. That's actually a really good example. Yeah, that's maybe better than any example that Hume gives. Because there, like the, the, the whole united appearance really does lead us in the wrong direction. Um and and when I say, and again, when I say wrong direction, like maybe the taller one really is big, looks bigger, right? So um, but uh but if we treat it as bigger in volume than the, than the short one, then we get inconsistent results in the end, right? Like, and to prevent that, we can, yeah, we can measure how much water each one will take. So that's a similar type of production for this measurement by a ruler. Um, and, um, and we use that to say, well, what's bigger, but it's not really bigger because, um, again, we've learned this procedure for getting a more consistent standard. It's really just a different standard, right? Like according to the original standard, the taller one was bigger, it looked bigger, right? But we're adopting a new standard that's a better standard because it's more consistent with itself. And it's more consistent with the principle that, I guess, more consistent with itself, given the principle that if you take away a part of something, it should get smaller. <laughs> and if you add a part to it, it should get bigger. So um, and that principle ends up being the connection between the looser standard and the strict standard. <laughs> right? Like we know that in principle, if you could count the indivisible parts, you could use that to correct the loser standard to the strict standard. But we can't do that. <laughs> so, um, right. So um, uh, we can't do that. And because we can't do that, we still are really left with completely with two completely different standards. The strict standard, which is just or correct, but we can't use it. And this looser standard and its various corrections which we can use, but what we're measuring isn't strictly speaking size or quantity. It's just a certain as indefinable aspect of appearance. <laughs> um, okay, so that's like, that's a short version of everything he said about this, about the first man. I want to, this is my plan, and I don't remember how much of this I got to last time I did this. But um, so my plan is, having finished this summary, so at least if I run out of time, I will have said all the important things about this. 
I'm going to go on to talk about this one also in a kind of like overview way, and then I'm going to go walk back and talk about some of the arguments in more detail. But um, but the reason I'm doing it that way is because it may well turn out that I never get time to go back and talk to them about them in detail. Therefore, at least I will have summarized them. All right. So um, so this one now I'm going to erase some of the stuff. Each part of extension is of some is of some definite quality. That's what that clip is saying. You, can, you can't read my writing by looking at each letter. You have to judge by the united appearance. <laughs> right. <laughs> so uh, um, so this is supposed to show that a vacuum is impossible. Um, this is um, section five on page 102 in your edition. The bad thing about that penguin edition, I mean, as far as I know, the text is accurate, but like they don't have some extras, like this one has the, all the paragraphs numbered, so you can refer to a smaller piece of text, but oh well. Get what you pay for, I guess. So, um, right, if the second part of my system be true, it's the very beginning of section five, that the idea of space or extension is nothing but the idea of visible or tangible points distributed in a, in a certain order, it follows that we can form no idea of a vacuum or space where there is nothing visible or tangible. I mean, I guess. That is, we can form no visible idea of a visible vacuum, nor tangible idea of a tangible vacuum. Um, so, um, right, so this means no vacuum. So it looks like in the big dispute between proponents of the vacuum and proponents of the plenum, right? Vacuum means empty in Latin, and it's the, like the neuter adjective meaning empty, and plenum means full. <laughs> so a plenum is the opposite of a vacuum. So, right, so, so um, in the big dispute between proponents of the vacuum and proponents of the plenum, it looks like Hume has come down on the side of the plenum. But, and this is one of my favorite things about this, um, Hume is so tricky. It turns out that what Hume thinks is correct is, so to speak, a lot more like there is a vacuum than it is like there is no vacuum. <laughs> so, um, in particular, Hume agrees. Um, these are, this is like, it, um, later on in Section five in your edition, it's at the bottom of page 110 on the top of page 111. He agrees on the following two things. Number one, the matter, intervening matter, for example, the air inside a room, um, could be annihilated, could possibly be annihilated without making the surrounding pieces of matter coincide. That sounds like we're saying that there can be a vacuum, right? With, and, sorry, and without anything else moving in, right? Without any motion at all. So without any motion at all, it could, it could possibly happen that all in the air in this room would suddenly be annihilated. Nothing else would change. The two, the, the different parts of the walls and the ceiling, whatever, would not touch each other. So it sounds like there is a vacuum. That's number one. Number two, he agrees that a body can move. It can move on indefinitely um, without encountering any resistance and without any other body moving out of its way. So like move on indefinitely is important, I guess, because 
you know, this is something, it, this is an argument in Aristotle already that, that you know, Parmenides said that um, the world is all full of like one big thing. And so their motion is impossible. Like later, Zeno had these other tricky arguments that motion is impossible. But Parmenides just said motion is impossible because there's no room for it. And Arist Aristotle said, well, what about rotation? <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, so like rotation and generally speaking, circulation is possible in a plenum. Um, and like um that's why if you look in like the later parts of Descartes' principles of philosophy, like the parts no one reads now, including me, but I've looked at the pictures and <laughs> in the pictures. There's all kinds of pictures of like stuff circulating <laughs> because Descartes believes in a plenum and that's the kind of motion that's possible. So everything is like moving in vortices and you know, right. So, but Hume is saying something can continue indefinitely without encountering any resistance and without anything moving out of its way. So that also sounds like there's a vacuum. So how is that consistent with his saying that a vacuum is impossible? Well, what he said is, we can form no idea of a vacuum. And he says that in these cases, so like take the first case first. That's the easiest to understand. So like, there was something colored or solid in here. Now it's an island. Annihilation is not supposed to take that one. It's supposed to be interesting. But anyway, so now it's annihilated. Um, um, now there's nothing between the walls, and they don't touch each other. So don't we have the idea of a vacuum in here? And Hume says, no, you have the absence of an idea of any matter that's in here. So, um, you know, I have an idea of the walls. My idea of the walls resembles the walls. That is, it's the same overall shape as the walls. I think, you know, like here, it's a little bit clearer what he would say as opposed to in the case of color. You know, isn't it the case that the walls are really a completely different shape than what you're seeing because they have all these little big bumps that you can't see. But, you know, I think you could say like, there's a kind of resemblance that exists in averaging out the walls. <laughs> It's harder to say that about color. So anyway, so right, so my idea of the walls resembles the walls. Um, and just as there's no matter here between the walls, there's no idea here between my ideas of the walls. And Hume says, I mean, Hume actually discusses an easier case than this, and it's a visible case, right? So he says, um, there are two, actually, this is one of the places where the visible and tangible seem to come apart. So let me discuss both the visible and the tangible case. So the visible case is there's two bright points, and other than that, everything is dark. So you see these two bright points. Um, well, actually, so let me, let me, yeah, I guess, so he says these two bright points um, have the same appearance. 
So again, this is a manner of the uh, like um, united overall appearance. These two these two bright points have the same appearance that they would have if you introduce something visible in between. So when you put this thing in or take it out, your impression of the points doesn't change. Um, and similarly, he says, like, imagine, but now we talked about moving your hand. That's the asymmetry, right? Like here, he seems to, he thinks about seeing the whole thing at once, the united appearance. Here he talks about moving your hand and you feel something solid here and then your hand keeps moving. Now, I mean, like you might think that you should draw that as feeling your hand go through here. But Hume says that the sensation of motion in your hand is not itself, it's not solidity or color. It's just a, like a, a sensation of something happening in time. Um, this, I guess, is one place where it becomes important. Like, are we sure the parts of that sensation can't be disposed to each other in space? Or, I don't know, but anyway, so like first you feel solidity, then for a certain amount of time, you feel your hands moving and no solidity. And then after that time, you feel solidity again. And he says that those two feelings of solidity are the same as if you had felt that sensation of motion and solidity the whole time. <laughs> right? So, um, like, these two sensations don't change nor does the sensation of motion for a time in between them, but in between them in time, right? <laughs> so uh, those things don't change, but meanwhile, this does change, but in one case, you also feel this whole series of solid points arranged next to each other, and in the other case, you don't. You only feel the two, two solid points. Um, so like why there's that, like why doesn't he use a case where like, you know, this is my arm <laughs> and I feel this point here and this point here. Like that would be more like the whole united appearance that I see with my eyes all at once. So like apparently he thinks we get the, the idea of tangible extension only by moving past solidity. Even though the motion itself is not, the sensation of motion is not a sensation of extension. So I'm not sure I understand what's going on. We go back to the visible case. Um, so in the visible case, he says, now, so like we learned from experience that. Um, certain visible things can be put in here without any change in these. Um, and yeah, this is why I wish we could make it work with the tangible one, because he says, we learn by experience they can be put in here with no resistance. But there, there's no such thing as visible resistance, is there? Or maybe there is. They don't have to be accelerated. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how to understand that. But anyway, so we learned that certain visible things can be put in here. And we learned by experience that those visible things that can be put in here are all the same size as each other. Right, so that like if we know, like let's let's say that this is my one meter stick, <laughs> my visible one meter stick. Um, I know by experience that it can be introduced into this into this darkness between these points without any change in the points. Um, now I also know by experience that anything else that's the same size as that one meter stick can also fit in there. 
So here's something else that's the same size as the one meter stick. And I know, but again, all, I, the reason I keep saying by experience is that we only know this by experience, right? Like there's nothing about this, in, this overall impression per se that, in, that, that is comparable to a one meter stick. In fact, Hume says that if you turn off these two bright points, and now there's only darkness, he says, there's no difference between the impressions that person now receives and the impressions received by someone who's been blind since birth. Um, this, there's just the lack of visible sensation without parts, indivisible. That's how you describe it. Um, okay, so, but now suppose we turn this po these points back on. So there's nothing in this impression that's one meter long. There's nothing that could possibly have the same number, using the strict standard for a second, there's nothing that could possibly have the same number of indivisible points as this stick. Because um, the darkness doesn't have any points. The darkness isn't anything. It has zero parts. It's the absence of ideas, <laughs> right? So, um, so like we only learn. I own the only way I know that this meter stick can go between these. That is that without without any resistance, I can go from a situation where these points are like this to another situation where there's a visible stick between them, is by experience. And the only way I know that the same thing holds for all and only objects of the same length is by experience, right? Like it could have been that, you know, this one meter stick can go in there and so can an element. But we learned by experience that's not true. And so that's why we start to attribute a, a fictitious side to the configuration. When we attribute to it the size of the object that can be introduced here. Um, and that's what kind of fools us into thinking we have an idea of a vacuum. We think that, that we feel like we can almost, so to speak, see the size of this. this but really, we're not seeing anything here. <laughs> but what we're really doing is remembering that when things are in, give this overall appearance, that, that objects of a certain size can move between them. <laughs> I told you this was tricky. <laughs> um, I even might say, like, it has the air of paradox about it as Hume says at the beginning of the section, right? Like it almost seems like this, is, sorry, at the beginning of, of part two, section, the beginning of section one, whatever has the air of paradox and is contrary to the first and most unprejudiced notions of mankind is often greedily embraced by philosophers as showing the superiority of their science, which could discover opinions so remote from vulgar conception. And then he says, on the other hand, anything proposed to us which causes to pride and admiration gives such a satisfaction to the mind that it indulges itself in those agreeable emotions. So, like, um, I feel like that's exactly what's going on between Hume and me here. <laughs> like, this is such a bizarre thing to say. And yet it works if you think about it. That I'm like, wow. <laughs> I love this part. Now, I mean, then Hume also claims that therefore I'm going to believe in this, which I don't know. If that that doesn't that part doesn't seem to work here. But um, um, uh, but it's true that I like it. <laughs> and yet it's weird because that's what Hume is saying about like the bad kind of philosophers who are not like him. Yeah. So <laughs> It's basically less about like the two points of light and more about like what an object that about like the um, 
like what they create in the sense of like making another object that passes through them be obstructed by them? Well, it's in, so I guess so like first of all, you have to accept that there's a way these points look. <laughs> and like we want to say about that way they look is it's how far apart they are, right? But Hume says there's nothing here. Right, where you think there's a distance, there's just nothing. So that appearance can't really be analyzed as how far apart they are, but it's something about their appearance. <laughs> and that thing about their appearance doesn't change when other can can remain fixed while something else changes. And what can change is, and so like the simplest way would be by creation and annihilation, right? What can change is something suddenly can appear between the two points. Now there's a distance between, right? That is the third standard. We can measure, we can say exactly what the distance is between them. It's the number of indivisible parts. And well, first we have to know what a straight line is, which is also a little bit of a problem. But anyway, um, it's, uh, if, if this thing is, is straight. Uh, in, anyway, so there are problems with this. The strict standard is even more problematic than I was saying. But like, forget that complication. Assume that we can we know how to draw a straight line from this, mm -hmm. and then we can count the individual parts on the straight line. That tells us exactly what the distance is between them now, right? Now that this thing is there, we know what the distance is between. Them. The distance between them is this length. Now we take this, but now this thing can be annihilated. Or if you don't want magic creation and annihilation, Hume says motion is pretty much the same thing as creation and annihilation, right? As with respect to this place, right? Because motion means that there was nothing there, and now there's something there. <laughs> right. So, um, so th that's why, like, this is. This discussion is its answer both to the annihilation of the air in the room and to the indefinite motion of a body, right? Like you say, this, those are basically about the same thing. The question is, like, where can things be created and annihilated without resistance? So, right. So, anyway, so like now we annihilate this or move it away. Um, now the points still have the same appearance, but now there's there isn't a distance between them anymore, right? So the question is, why well, think now something else is created in between? Why well, think that this thing has to be the same size as the other thing that was there before? And Hume says there is no reason to think it, but we learn by experience that's the case. Yeah. Um so if if things were laid out so that even an object of just one part or no parts, whatever, the smallest object couldn't go in that space between them, or I guess not, but whatever, couldn't be there. Um, I don't see it like, it's clear that he doesn't think that that's always the case, right? Like sometimes things can go in between other things. I don't know why he doesn't just say that, like, that is our, that's what a vacuum is. Um, well, you know, so he says, like, at the beginning, he says in that, um, so, um, uh, at the beginning, he says there is no idea of a, he says there is no idea of a vacuum. At the end, he says, like, is a vacuum possible? It depends what you mean by is a vacuum possible. If you mean, can intervening matter be annihilated without anything moving? Can something move through space indefinitely without resistance? Then yes, there's a vacuum, but we have no idea of it. Um, because 
it's nothing. And it, the, the idea of nothing is nothing, <laughs> right? So if on the other hand, by a vacuum, you mean um, something we have an idea of that's in, that, that takes up space, but is neither colored nor solid, then there is no vacuum. Right, so, I, you know, um, but I think I thought what you were getting at before, like, so what I was about to ask you about this is, so it's clear that what we learn by experience here, like before I was imagining using the strict standard of size, but of course we don't use that, right? Like we didn't learn by experience how many indivisible parts are in the visible thing that can be created there. Did you have a question or? Uh, I guess I was going to ask is if like uh, you can't use a strict standard of size like a meter because the the relation at the relation between these two points of light like this relation of here and here however it's perceived still persists even if it's like this small or it's this big and we have no idea I don't know whether uh, like an elephant goes in or not like whether it's the size without having all these other things to, to ground it, we don't know. Well, uh, yeah, I think, I mean, there's two different things here. So one is, yeah, we don't know a priori, as Kant would say. Uh, maybe maybe Hume would use a priori that way in this context too. But anyway, we, right, we don't know in advance of experience that there's any particular size that, that goes with that appearance, right? Because the appearance is, again, it's the appearance is not really the appearance of any quantity. The only quantity here is two, right? It's two points. But other than that, it's, it's basically like a qualitative appearance. They look a certain way, you know? So, um, um, so, so like, yeah, we don't know in advance that there's a particular size of objects that can go in here. So yeah, it could be that a meter can go in there and an elephant can go in there and a grain of sand can go in there, right? Um, but uh, um, but we know from experience that that's not true. But the question is, what do we know from experience, right? So we know from experience that all and only bodies of a certain size can go in there. But then I was asking, because remember, there's two different things you can mean when you say they're all the same size. One is the strict standard. So the strict standard says, when I say they're all the same size, I mean they all have the exact same number of indivisible parts. But um, whether that's true or not, we don't know it by experience because we don't experience the indivisible parts. Things that hey, they're too small to see. Um, and even if we could see them, they would be too small to count, right? It would be too hard, right? Like I was saying, that Hume says, even in the case of our own ideas, where we we do and like must feel like Hume says we must. <laughs> We, every part of them must be in our mind, right? So we, we must have all the ideas of the indivisible parts. They're still, they're too hard to work with. We can't count them, right? So like, um, so that's not what we experienced. Rather, what we experienced is that according to the looser standard, the things that fit in here are all the same size. So it's really a relationship between two things, neither of which is strictly quantitative that we've learned, right? I mean, we've learned that the things that can go in here without altering the overall appearance of these points have the same overall appearance of each other, <laughs> have the same largeness appearance, some aspect of their overall appearance. But it's not really quantity because real quantity means counting part. <laughs> um, so what that means is the thing. All these arguments about how space has to be composed of indivisible points and whatever. Well, I mean, I guess not whatever. The argument that space has to be composed of a finite number of indivisible points. Um, that's talking about an extension. So something we can actually see or touch. 
Did you have a question? I guess you had, yeah, would that be like a, a quantity in relation to a different standard than it's it's strict like absolute number of parts? Uh, well, I mean, then we start to look at this loose standard as kind of quantitative because we 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 learn that we can correct it according to the principle mm -hmm. that when we take, but not an indivisible part, but a big part away, <laughs> that the appearance changes, the, the, the thing looks smaller. So like, there's something you can count. So there's something quantitative about it. You can't count the indivisible part, but you can count the big parts, right? Like you can count how many teaspoons of water fill, it, fill into each cylinder, you know? Um, so, um, and then we can apply that sort of quantitative thing to the, to the empty space, quote unquote, because of this empirical relationship, the things that look about the same size fit into the same, between the same two points without the two points changing their appearance. So, um, but what I was, what I was starting to say is like, this argument that um, extension has to be composed of indivisible parts. I think this is part of why I put extension in quotes here. Extension means specifically an extended idea or something that resembles an extended idea. So it has parts that are colored or solid. In this case, there is no extension. Now the question is like, um, is there some sense in which this kind of space is composed of indivisible parts? And I think the answer is no, right? Because I mean, there would, like, if, if we could use the strict standard, then we can transfer the strict standard to the to the, the quasi extension that's between the points, right? We could say that the bodies that fit in here always have exactly one thousand and thirty five indivisible parts, right? And so, even though this, strictly speaking, is not a distance at all, we can count it as a distance of one thousand and thirty five. Yeah. Oh. Um... I guess with, 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 without without like connect, but without something connecting with the point, put in, would 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 you would you say that that space is like valid at all? But like there is a space where there are just like two points, but there is but there is, there isn't like a vacuum between them or or anything. Well, no, I mean, so he says there's nothing here. You don't see anything. Um, there's not so there's nothing you can see here. And so, like, you don't have a visible idea of anything. I mean, there might be something there that's too small for you to see or whatever. But, um, but as far as you're concerned, there's nothing there, and so you have no idea of it. And so, like, is it really a space? No, it's not really anything. It's not. <laughs> Again, remember, he says that if the light, if the points go out then it's the same as being blind. I mean, this is something, we didn't read this part of Locke and it may actually, maybe I should assign it, it's short. It's, you know, um, not this year, but I mean, in future years, but that where Locke says that we'd have positive, we can have positive ideas of primitive qualities, right? So like, even if, Darkness is really just the absence of light. Our idea of darkness may be a positive idea. That's according to Locke, right? So Locke would disagree with that whole um, that whole line of thought that says that you don't have an idea of the darkness between the points. Rather, you have no idea of anything between the points. And therefore, like Locke would say, that no, the experience of seeing total darkness is not the same as the experience of being blind. Or it might not be, right? It might consist of having black ideas in every direction. Um, but Hume is saying, no, that the experience of total darkness is the same as being blind. You don't have any visible light. 
So even when you bring the two points back, like the rest of it is still the same as being blind. So it's not something you see that has parts that you can see or not see. Um, I mean, again, What Locke is saying seems much closer to, it seems much easier to believe. It has less of the air of paradox. <laughs> but on the other hand, what Hume is saying is so clever <laughs> that I want it to work. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's just, it's it's interesting to me because it, like, when I think about it, the grain of sand thing and how, you know, if you look at it one way, it has one part. And if you look at it another way, it has a trillion parts or whatever. That makes a lot more sense to me than saying this. <laughs> yeah, that part is oh, that part that part also has something weird. And right? they don't seem like the same thing. Oh no, I don't no, they're they're two parts of the same view. They do go to they do go together in a certain way. Right? I mean, that was one of the details that I might get to. That that Hume says that like indivisible parts would be nothing if they didn't have some quality. But something can't be made of nothing, right? Because, like, something with more than one part, it has like a certain uh, property that makes it what it is, namely the, namely the number of parts. But now, if you if there's only one left, that's that's why I said you want to think about it as not having any parts as opposed to having one part. Hey, when there's only one left. Or, or maybe you should think about it according. I mean, Hume, I guess, does think this. There's a whole tradition that one is not a number. But the smallest number is two, right? Because like number is a measure of plurality or something like that, right? So, but anyway, however you look, however exactly you look at it, Hume's point is when you take when you get rid of all the composition, there's nothing left. But indivisibility is just a negative, right? So it would be nothing at all if it didn't also have some quality. Um, so the two parts are supposed to go together in some way. Even that, I mean, you could admit that. Yeah, I think the thing about a vacuum, the thing about how a vacuum, we don't have an idea of a vacuum, but a vacuum really is possible. That I guess really can could come off this whole system. I mean, it would, I mean, it would no longer be consistent with Newton, maybe, or something, which he would like. But you know, I mean, if he were to agree with Locke that in this situation what we have is two bright ideas and lots of dark ideas, or something like that. Or of course, Locke doesn't say we have lots of dark ideas. Yeah, and Locke, I think, agrees that empty space is indivisible, but he thinks that we do get an idea of this distance. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, um, uh, so, you know, he could say that, like, visible space is, is a plenum. There's always some color in every direction. You count black as a color. And as for tangible space, what would he say? I mean, I guess if you could agree that the sensation of motion actually contains quantities, sensation of moving my hand actually contains quantity. Locke probably thinks that too. I mean, he doesn't, you know how he talks about the sensation that your two hands can't get any closer to each other. Um, but from Hume's point of view, that's just a certain sensation of muscular tension. No change. There's no sensation of distance in that. But Locke maybe does think that we feel that our hands are a certain distance from each other. Anyway, that probably thinks that we feel when we're moving them. That they're moving through a certain distance, whereas Hume thinks we get a series of feelings from our muscles. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think they're the only one. Yeah. Yeah. I I think I thought of maybe a better way to like 
phrase what <laughs> yeah. I guess is making me uncomfortable about the, that idea. <laughs> Even though it is, I agree, it's really interesting or fun to think yeah. about. Um, so if we have, it's clear to me at least that like, I know that when I look at the, the two things separated or that it look a certain way that makes it, I know that I can put a thing in between them versus one where I couldn't put anything right, yeah. right, right next to each other. If one of them was moving, it would start pushing the other one right away in the case where they're pressed up against each other, or it would take a while. And like, how how could Locke explain the fact that right. I know that it would take a while without us knowing that there's some distance between them? Or is it just that like we know from experience that when things move, they change the size of the thing that could fit between them or something like that? I don't know. That's... I, you know, I left out part of what he says about, about why we, why we, how we come to interchange this with with an actual extension, which is he says that also certain effects that depend on um, certain effects that would that, that would increase or decrease decrease as the size of the actual extension changes, that when you take it out, you, you find the same. Um, so to speak, at a distance effect, right? So like, in other words, like say like one of these, instead of the bright point, it's like a light bulb and this is like a ball out, you know? So um, if you have an actual extension in between them, then the shorter this is, the, the, the better the ball will be lit because it will be closer to the light bulb, right? And Hume says, and we also find, but again, only by experience. <laughs> but I mean, and it, by the way, if you say Hume, well, what a coincidence, what's the explanation of this? He'll say, well, you know, there's fundamental laws of the mind that don't have explanations, <laughs> right? Or, or we will never know the explanation. But anyway, so like we, we also find that when you annihilate the extension in between them, um, uh, you know, the brightness depends in the same way on, on like what would fit in it. <laughs> so I think the time to reach the other one is, is an example of an effect like that, right? That when you put this in here, like the time for this to reach this depends on how long this is. Um, and, uh, we learn that even when there's nothing there, the time will be the time it would be if there were something there. <laughs> um, because again, we can't learn that the time is proportional to this, to the quantity of this, because this has no quantity. It's nothing, right? So we can't learn that directly. We can only, I mean, we, you know, we, we do know that this brightness will be different given different overall appearances, but we only connect that to a quantity by, yeah, I guess, so what you're saying is, can't we connect it to a quantity by motion? Not in an ultimate way. But I guess yeah, maybe, and I think maybe you said this a while ago, and I kind of skipped over it. But maybe you do have to bring this in. That, like, that's only a good measure if this motion is at a constant velocity, right? Like. Mm -hmm. That is, you have to say that, um, like, because the idea would be to, like, that's not a light bulb anymore. So the idea would be to, like, arrange these in order of length by the time it takes to move from one to the other. But that's only going to be a measure of 
lane if the, these, the speed is the same in each case. But how do you know what the speed is? So you have to compare the time to the length. <laughs> right, so you already have to have a measure of the length. Yeah, I think that's the answer. So like, but on the other hand, I think it, it is interesting to talk about the case where we find that nothing can fit between the two. Not even one indivisible part can fit between the two. So in that case, um, what fictitious length do we assign here? Something smaller than the smallest indivisible part. I mean, it's fictitious. So it doesn't violate the principle that nothing can be smaller than a simple thing. Because it isn't anything. But I mean, that goes together with also what I was saying about how we have to use the loose standard, which I think means that um, we don't know that any particular number of indivisible parts corresponds to that distance, right? Because we don't have that experience. So, you know, what this all goes to show is that, like, because, like, what we usually call space is empty space or potentially empty space, like the place where a body could be. And I don't think Hume, anything Hume says tends to indicate. So, like, so Hume says distances in that space are a fiction, <laughs> but they're a consistent fiction. Right, like that we build up, that we necessarily build up because of certain experience. And within the terms of that fiction, you can ask, is empty space composed of indivisible parts? And I think nothing in Hume's argument for this tends to show that empty space is composed of indivisible parts. Um, um, I mean, we just don't know any relation between empty space and the number of indivisible parts. So we don't have any experience of that. So we couldn't have set up a fictitious correspondence between them. Um, and yeah, we can't guarantee that, for example, no matter what this appearance, you'll always be able to put at least one indivisible part in. There's no reason to think that, and we don't have any experience of that because it would be too small to <laughs> see. Um, so, um, so the trickiness goes like I think the trickiness goes beyond this and actually gets back to this. Like, if, although Hume doesn't say this, I think Hume, and I don't know if he wants to say this. But he could say not only that Newton is right to assume a vacuum, but also that New Newton is right to assume that space is continuous. Um, even though there's no such thing as a continuous quantum. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know if this was Newton's two sentences, but or actually, I kind of just confused myself there a bit. Hume says that there's a finite amount of parts in space, right? And was he talking about the whole of space or is he talking about just like a, a specific quantity of it? I think he's talking about the whole. No, he doesn't no, he doesn't show that that space that, yeah, he doesn't talk about space as a whole. Oh, okay, never mind. At least not in not in this section, right? I mean, I think he agrees with Locke that you have no idea of space as a whole. Uh, He's always talking about some finite space. Um, what, you know, so space as a whole, I mean, I think like insofar as we can fictitiously talk, talk about the size of space as a whole, I think he would say it has infinite parts, right? It has infinitely many indivisible parts. Um, but you know, but that would have to be space like that is assuming there's bodies everywhere, 
an infinitely large body would have an infinite sum of parts. Do we know that there is an infinitely large body? Locke seems to think we know there isn't. Um, Hot space is one of the same kinetic numbers. We, we can both prove that there is and that there isn't. Those are the something wrong about our assumptions. You, I'm not sure if he talks about that either. <laughs> right, because like, if, you know, if there isn't an infinitely large body, then um, what's outside the body has no parts. There's not because there's nothing outside the body. <laughs> uh -huh. So yeah, I don't know. That's the best I can do to answering that. Um, I think if we thought about it longer, it would lead us towards Kant or something. But um, okay, so that was the end of my summary part, and now you can see why I was prudent in deciding to do the summary first. But I mean, it was partly because there was a lot of questions, which is good. I'd rather like spend less time, get to less material, but have people actually ask me questions. Um, so I probably won't get back into detail on the arguments, right? Like there's a multi-step argument that's supposed to show. I mean, it starts with that there's nothing too small to imagine, and then like ends up proving that that things. External objects also have indivisible parts. But I wanted to instead switch to a little bit in the last 10 minutes and talk about the consequences for mathematics. So, um, So Hume says that this system that he's developed, this is in um, section four on page 90. So he says that mathematics is contrary to this system in its demonstration, but perfectly conformable in its definitions. My present business then must be to defend the definitions and refute the demonstrations. Right, so um, the reason he says it's perfectly conformable to the definitions, so he's thinking about like the traditional definitions of point, line, and claim at, at the beginning of Euclid's elements. Um, you know, so like a line is, and by a line here, we're not defining straight line yet. It's just like a, what we would call a curve. Um, a line is something that has length, but not, but not breadth or depth. A point is something that has, well, I guess, I don't know exactly what Euclid says. I just don't remember. Aristotle would definitely say you have to add that it has position, but neither length, but neither length, depth, you know, breadth, or whatever those two things are. All right. Um, so Hume says, well, look, if there's no indivisible parts, um, then something that has no depth or breadth uh, is nothing. <laughs> There's nothing there because it has no depth or breadth. Um, so that definition only makes sense if you believe in indivisible parts. And similarly, the, the definition of point and so forth. Um, but actually, he quotes the definition here. A surface is defined to be length and breadth without depth. A line to be length without breadth or depth. A point to be what has neither length, breadth, nor depth. So he actually doesn't put knife. You put this. That's what I'm saying. 
Uh, anyway, um, but it, there's definitions like this in Newton. These are traditional definitions. So he says, you know, so mathematicians in talking about lines with no width are like without realizing it, committing themselves to indivisible parts. No width means that it can't be divided in this direction. <laughs> That is, it has its one indivisible part Why? <laughs> oh, so, uh, but it's contrary in its demonstrations, right? So I already explained before we talked about Barclay's version of this, how, why mathematics is contrary in its demonstrations. That, you know, um, there's, you can, uh, Demonstrate that if the sides if, if the sides are made out of a certain number of indivisible parts, then um, there's no number of indivisible parts that will completely fill the diagonal. There'll always be something left over. So that means that no matter how small the supposed smallest part is. This line is always going to have a smaller part. Um, so there are no indivisible parts. So uh, so. Um, this is uh, something must have gone wrong between the definitions and the demonstrations. So Hume says, um, now, I mean, there's also a traditional view that, which not everyone agrees with, that the first principles in geometry are the definitions and everything is proved from the definitions. That's kind of pretty far into the way we think about axiomatizing geometry. But actually even the term axiomatizing is far into the way they think about axioms. But in any case, um, but uh, um, so the demonstration, I guess we'll have axioms and steps, you know, like deriving things from it. But if the definitions are just, then the, the, then, and, the max, and the axioms are true, then the conclusions should be true. So I'm not sure whether, you know, whether he agrees that the demonstration is from the definition. It doesn't really matter for these purposes. Um, so, but the main point is like, uh, where is the problem? Um, and Hume says, as Barclay said, it's not a pro it's not like a mistake that was made at some step in the demonstration. Turn that on. It always happens in there. Um, rather, this is an explanation. It's on page thirty. No, sorry, page ninety-three. One moment. I maintain that none of these demonstrations can have sufficient weight to establish such a principle as this of infinite divisibility. And that because with regard to such minute objects, they are not properly demonstrations, being built on ideas which are not exact and maxims which are not precisely true. When geometry decides anything concerning the proportions of quantity, we ought not to look for the utmost precision and exactness. And the reason is because geometry, the whole science doesn't operate with the just notions of quantity and order. It works with the, the standards of overall appearance. In fact, Hume actually says that um, 
although the appearance of a straight line must be produced by some feature of the order of its indivisible parts, we don't know what that feature is. <laughs> it's a really weird thing to say, right? But that, like, you might think if there's indivisible parts, you could kind of get like a Cartesian geometry going here. Um, but I guess maybe the problem is that we don't have... So each indivisible part may be close to lots of other indivisible parts. And you know, you have to ask which one is in the perpendicular direction. And to do that, you have to have a definition of perpendicular. And to that, to do that, you already have to know what the feature of the order of parts is that makes things straight and angles right and whatever, right? something like that. So anyway, he says we don't even know. Like we couldn't tell whether the line is straight or not by examining the order of the indivisible parts if we wanted to. We can only tell by examining the appearance. Um, so geometry is built on the fiction that we could make that loose standard stricter and stricter until it was absolutely precise. But that's a fiction. We can't do that in real life. And so like in real life, this is a little bit different than what Barkey says about this. Uh, I'm over time, so I guess I won't explain why it's a little bit different. But you can think about why it's a little bit different. Um, um, I mean, it's different because, no, no, I won't say it. I'm out of time. All right. <laughs> I'll see you next time. Does anyone still argue?